Connector podcast. It's Thursday evening. We're on the Smart Connector group and we're here live with one of my clients, Max Lawrence. Welcome, Max. Hi. So Max is a an ADHD business coach, but he has an incredible career, um, which we're going to talk about before that. Um, so we're, we're really going to get into this whole topic of ADHD tonight and talk about uh, why so many entrepreneurs have ADHD, why some of them are undiagnosed, how to actually recognize ADHD, and also why ADHD can be a business superpower, not, not just a disability. So we're going to be looking at all of those issues tonight. So Max is the expert. So Max, I think probably the best way to start is just for you to introduce yourself and just to tell your story. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, Jade. Um, so, yeah, I, I um, where to start? I basically discovered that I had ADHD only just under two years ago after um, a career of building boutique hotels in Morocco, in Marrakesh. And I, went, I ended up going out there through my dad's business and very quickly sort of ended up building my own. And um, I... I, I, I I, I, after school, I didn't go to university. I kind of knew that I wanted to go to Morocco. I loved Morocco and it was going to be a year. It ended up tend, turning into 12. And basically, I, um, yeah, I ended up buying land and building two boutique hotels that became very well known and very busy. And, but, um, and I kind of managed in my chaotic way because I, I didn't, didn't know this at the time. I know now looking back that I, I was quite chaotic and, you know, I was very distractible and I'd be into one thing one day. And my dad would always say to me, you know, you don't finish things. You start always new, new things, new, exciting things. I want to do this. And so we get going. And then next week, it's that I want to do that. And that, you know, I now, I now know was um, definitely fueled by ADHD. Um, and in Morocco, I somehow I did, you know, I, I got it together and I, I, I always kind of succeeded with things, but um, yeah, I really had, you know, I, I, I got onto some projects that were really quite big and, you know, I'd borrowed money from banks and from family and I, I needed to make this work. So when the motivation is there, um, it's much easier to focus. And so, um, yeah, I, I had these successes and I also ran a production company in Marrakesh looking after lots of fashion shoots and, uh, you know, it was all very exciting and it was exciting because I was kind of, I needed excitement. So I was always running towards the next exciting thing. And this is the thing with ADHD is that if we're not interested in what we're doing, we just lose interest. We, we just get, our, our mind gets dragged to something else and we, we something catches our eye and we're off in a new direction. Um, so I was very much like that. And then the hotels were, were successful. And, um, and I mean, about hotels, I built two hotels with a friend, one of them, in a year. And I, so I had these two simultaneous building sites going on, one in the Atlas Mountains, one in the, Palm, in the Palmery, which is just outside Marrakesh, you know, with about 350 workers on these two sites. And I was rushing between the two. It was like one hotel building site wasn't enough for me. I needed to have two going on <laughs> because, you know, one would get too boring, so I'd go to the other one, you know. And I, I see this pattern all the way through my life now, going right back to childhood, you know, when in the 80s, um, Sundays were horrible days for me because in those <laughs> days, the law was that no shops could be open except a news agent from nine till 12 to go and get your papers and your sweets kind of thing. I remember and, it well. Yeah, you know, it's like another world, but I... I found Sundays excruciating because my dad's office, which was in a stable block kind of next to our house, there were no workers there, you know, at the weekend because I used to go into the office and chat to all the girls and stick envelopes. And and so Sunday was this dead day. And I um, I, I, I remember this in therapy. And I, I did 20 years of therapy before I got diagnosed with ADHD. And, you know, I used to go and set off the burglar alarm by pushing um, pushing the panic button secretly because I knew that 10 minutes later there'd be a police car at the gate, blue lights, all very exciting. <laughs> I only admitted this to my parents, you know, in the last probably 10 or 15 years, but I think they kind of knew. Um, and so I was always hunting after what I now know to be dopamine. I just thought it was like adrenaline. I needed excitement. It 
if it was dull, I was, you know, I was bored, I was kind of low energy, but I could get very fired up and, you know, around exciting stuff. And so, yeah, there's this theme through my childhood and my adolescence and, you know, early adulthood in my 20s, building these hotels. But I got very bored when the hotels had opened. You know, the, the big challenge was to build them, uh, staff them, train the staff, equip them, you know, furnish them and, and for them to be beautiful and to get them to, to work. And we were running at very high occupancy and it was just like it became mundane. It became the same thing every day. It was just like my, I felt like my work was done. As soon as it became repetitive, you know, I was kind of um, I was bored. And um, and that's where the kind of alcohol stuff, you know, started kicking in and drugs. And, you know, I think I wasn't stimulated enough. And so I was kind of self-medicating, not knowing I had ADHD on alcohol and stimulants and, uh, you know, Morocco joints. And, you know, I mean, people self-medicate on all sorts of things, gambling, porn, you know. But for me, it got quite hairy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So obviously, I know your story, and it is it is an incredible story. And we talked about you writing a book one day, and I really think you should do that. Mm. Um, so let's get on to this um, th this issue of addiction because addiction and ADHD often go hand in hand, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I now know that ADHD people are six times more likely to become to struggle with addiction you know whether it's with food and overeating binge eating which I also struggle with chocolate is my problem um at night especially but yeah food drink drugs anything that floods the brain with dopamine for a few minutes um, yeah. because we're lacking in dopamine normal people's dopamine is there and in ADHD our dopamine levels are down here and so when you eat a piece of chocolate cake or you have sex or you have a pint of beer, it comes up to a normal place. And that's why a lot of ADHDers say, well, you know, I just kind of feel normal on it. You know, they'll take hard stimulant drugs and say, well, actually, I feel kind of normal. And I, at the beginning, you do until you start going too far with it, because it, it just brings the dopamine level up to a point where you're in perfect condition. And, you know, not, another example of this is in a, in a drama. You know, why are the fire services, ambulance services, police all full of ADHDers? Because we're really good in a crisis. When, you know, when everything's normal, we're distracted and looking at the ceiling and looking around. And then some drama happens. We get the yeah. rush of adrenaline with dopamine and the level comes up to normal. And then everybody else is like, jelly, what do we do? What do we do? Because they've got too much of it flying around. But we've been raised to the normal point. And so when my grandmother choked on an olive, the rest of my family were all like, didn't even know what to do not to move and I just calmly stood up walked around the table and went Puck, and the olive shot out because I was in a place with enough dopamine now that I could function well right right so now that you're talking about this we are talking about whether ADHD can be a business superpower now yeah. business and particularly entrepreneurship it can be very stimulating yeah. and uh do, doing deals in particular your yeah. business was a, a property business you did deals yeah. And, um, you know, I know I have a property business as well. I know that there is something very addictive about doing deals yeah. because um, you get that rush, don't you? You get that mm. high. Yeah. Um, so is that why um, why ADHD it can be a business superpower as well as a disability? I think it's that. And I think it's also the, you know, ADHD people, we tend to think, we look like we're not thinking at all because we're like lost, but actually the head is going a thousand ideas a minute. Yeah. And, um, and that's why we look like we're not focusing on what's happening because we're elsewhere with ideas and, and yeah. our ideas, you know, a lot of ADHD people think very much outside the box. So we would approach problems in a different way to other people. Um, I didn't know this at the time, but you know, my approach would, would be quite different from everybody else's. And, when I chose to put a hotel on the side of a hill overlooking a, a Berber village and nothing, a friend of mine said to me, you're completely mad to be buying this piece of land, you know, but I, I could see how it was going to be. And, um, and two years later it was full. And, you know, so we do look at stuff in a different way. I think we're good problem, problem solvers. Um, and so, yes, there are lots of people out there who've made real successes especially in entrepreneurship, because we're not very good employees. We don't turn up on time. We forget what we're supposed to bring. And so a lot of ADHDers tend to get fired 
a lot. <laughs> Getting fired is a is, is something very, very <laughs> common. And, um, you know, I, I've read stories about people being fired 100 times in two years, you know, which is excruciatingly painful. You know, if you need that job, whatever it is, flipping burgers or, or driving a bus, but you can't deliver because your executive functions, the functions which execute things. So ADHD is have all the knowledge. We have no problem with knowing in the back of the brain. We have the knowledge. We know what to do and how to do it. But we really struggle with ex the execution of things. So getting started or completing tasks um, and organization. You know, it can be quite chaotic. Um, I got around it not knowing what I was dealing with, but I got around it by building teams around me. So I didn't manage all those yeah. people. I built yeah. little teams and I would speak to one person who I knew was really organized. And that's how I must have, you know, um, made these things happen by just, you know, coordinating people with a, a very rough crayon, you know, rather than a, a precise pen. Um, but, yeah, I think the, the whole success, there are so many ADHD big success stories um, yeah. in our country. You know, Richard Branson's one. And, you know, there are lots. Um, and... So it, it's the creativity, the creative thinking, the different thinking, the problem solving. And also, yes, this um, this this need for excitement and risk taking. So we can be very impulsive. I mm -hmm. suffer a lot with my impulsivity. And but the impulsivity that nearly killed me later, you know, through addictions, um, I believe that's what made me buy that crazy bit of land on the edge of a hill. And, you know, when everybody said no, I just was like, yep. Yeah, I'm doing it. And, you know, I made lots of decisions that turned out to be fortuitous uh, along the way. But people were always looking at me sideways and going, what is this guy on? You know. <laughs> um, and you know. Of course, you when, he, when they were saying, what is this guy on? You were you were on a lot, weren't you, after a while? You oh, were, well, genuinely. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, the drugs and the drink kind of, it got to a point where it was all kind of fine. I was in my 20s, so it was quite normal to be doing partying. And, but I never quite knew when to end the party. And, um, and you know, it started going bad. And I, I came back to England and I, I went through a treatment center and I was introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous, which I hated, but in the end really saved my life because I got sober in Alcoholics Anonymous 15 years ago. And, um, and I, I lived nine years sober. I then had a few years of drinking normally, living in the countryside, very relaxed and happy. And it went well until something didn't go well. And then I kind of went through another spiral and it was that spiral that actually brought me to find out about ADHD. And I will say, because I think this, I think this is in, important that um, so many people get missed. You know, now they spot kids in school and they go off to the, the psychiatrist and the parent takes them and listens to the questions the parent is asking them. And so many parents now are sitting there listening, going, yeah, that's me too. That's me too. That's me too. I wonder if I might have, you know, and so loads of adults are being diagnosed with ADHD now that weren't before mm -hmm. through their children. Um, but I was missed for 20 years of therapy, some excellent therapists in London. You know, um, nobody ever mentioned ADHD to me. A, a top London psychiatrist who I saw for two years, he missed it. He recently apologized to me and said, you know, I kind of could have spotted that. He's retired now. And I said, no, what, you, you, you saved me as well. You kept me going through that that time. And eventually I got to this place where this one therapist um, based in Wiltshire actually said, you might want to check out ADHD. And I did. I got an audio book. And in London one day in the car, I was driving, listening to this thing. And at the end of chapter three, I just broke into tears at a traffic light because it was just like I suddenly understood myself. The, I had the explanation for all wow. this craziness really it was very um it was overwhelming because i you know you, you struggle with addiction and i i was sober but i felt like i was white knuckling it all, the whole time because i had this incessant obsession voice in my head sort of torturing me and um that has basically vanished through the adhd diagnosis through understanding but also through understanding the lack of dopamine, what I was, what my brain was hunting was dopamine and dopamine can be found in food, sex, drugs, you know, all sorts of um, things that are fine unless you do too much of them. And as ADHD is, we don't really have a, a gray, gray position. We're binary. We're either on or off. We're black or we're white. And so the middle path, <laughs> it doesn't really exist very much for us. 
Yeah, so, it's yeah. it's such a fascinating topic. So today, Max, you work with a lot of business people and entrepreneurs, so high performing, high functioning professionals and entrepreneurs yeah. mm. to help them solve ADHD. Now, at first sight, that's like, well, how on earth do you do that? So how do you actually uh, work with your clients to yeah. to help them? Well, firstly, I should say there is no solving ADHD. ADHD is here to stay. If you have it, it's going to be there. So me using those words, solve ADHD, what I really mean is solve your ADHD problems, the issues you, you have. So they people come to me, you know, and they're very successful. Most of them are really, you know, doing well. They've got companies that are that are thriving. Um and they come with very, you know, there are some common denominator things. So it's organization, it's procrastination, it's motivation, it's hopping around and, you know, like a blue ass fly, never being able to sit still and constantly managing this endless stream of new ideas that's uh -huh. so tempting to us all the time. We're like magpies. Anything that glistens, we're on it. We're on it. We're on it. And but we have we have so much going on that we often miss the routine stuff that we don't like, you know, the admin stuff, the, um, the you know, speaking to our teams um, about more mundane stuff. And, yeah, I mean, people basically know that they're struggling with something. Then they often realize that they've got ADHD, they get diagnosed. And it, like me, you know, it's a massive revelation. And they want change because when you get to 30 or 40 years old, and you've really suffered with this, um, you know, not understanding yourself and, upsetting people around you terrifying people around you 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 kind of just want you think i wish i'd found this out 20 years ago but it's not too late and now i really want my life to be better and the people around me who are near to me to be better um and so people are tend to be really keen and some of them have struggled a long time and they've tried it their own way and they're just fed up and they just this whole executive functions business is um, is really tricky it's actually very simple but you need I don't think it's possible to help yourself. And I'll give myself as an example here. I'm I'm helping people who have trouble procrastinating. You know, these are really bright people. They've got great things they, they're doing, but there are things that they're just struggling to even either get started or get finished. You know, that to-do list or those to-do lists that are everywhere are long and annoying. And I'm able to really quite easily help people break out of their procrastination. It, it, it surprises me how effectively I can do that with them but when I try and break out of my own procrastination um, it's really hard and actually that's what brought me to you as a client <laughs> is you know I, I I'm doing I've got this great coaching um, set up you know coaching ADHD entrepreneurs which I love and it's probably the most satisfying work I've ever done um, but I want to, you know, get better at social media and I want to put out a video of this and I want to put out, you know, make a film of this and write a book of that. But you know what? I could be here 10 years later in the same position, just coaching away. And um, that's why I came to you. And it's been so helpful. You know, I mean, you've unlocked something. Well, you're, you're, you're doing to me what I'm doing with my clients. Yes. Um, they need and I need somebody to um, to make me accountable. Because until there is accountability, uh, it's very hard to do something that doesn't really have a fixed due date on it. You know, we always push it to the back. And, um, you know, we've got so many things going on that, oh, it'll wait another day. But, you know, there are things that I'm doing with you that have waited two weeks. And I've said, no, I'm doing it in the next hour. But you know, <laughs> many, many, many days and hours later, it's still not done. So I'm finding that with you, I'm getting this. I think I'm getting a similar experience to what I'm providing my clients with. Obviously, I'm able to provide them with quite deep insight into the ADHD intensity of procrastination or disorganization. You know, I teach people how to use a calendar properly. Most people come in saying, oh, I use a digital calendar. And I say, show me. And they show me. And of course, I can show them immediately why it's not working, you know, um, because I developed my own organizational method over 15 years without knowing that I was why I was creating it I just knew that I needed you know to get things done so I I, I boiled this thing down into something that's become very very you know essential for me and as I teach it to other people they come back sort of two three weeks later saying this is amazing you know this has changed my life and that's so satisfying to me because it's my system it is very simple I can teach it in, a, in an hour but what's hard is sticking to it 
So I, yeah. I'm helping them through their objections, which are rooted in childhood experiences, and um, to and their objections and their and their kind of resistance to it. You know, we resist new things, and ADHD is resist hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so so Max, so I've noticed a comment that says ADHD is a label, and I've noticed this with a lot of a lot of um, call it disabilities, um, you know, mental um, conditions, brain, brain configurations, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Because uh, my my nephew had uh, he was diagnosed with Asperger's, and I know now yeah. they call it they just call it autism and ASD. so on. Yeah. Um, but some people really say, look, that that is wrong to actually label people mm. and that um, and that really people should should just like brains come in all sorts of different configurations and people should I just agree. be accepted for yeah. who they are without actually putting these labels on them. Um, but, you know, as humans, it, it helps us, doesn't it? We want to identify with a tribe. And if we see that somebody is actually got a cluster of symptoms or, or even just a, a brain that looks like ours, it makes us feel less alone, doesn't it? So yeah. is it a bad thing to well, have an think... ADHD label or diagnosis? It, I mean, is it any worse than calling somebody an entrepreneur? You know, an entrepreneur is just somebody who does um, business yeah. and sort of things or for themselves to make money. Okay, it's a group of symptoms that we've put a label of entrepreneur on it. Okay, so there's no negative connotation with entrepreneur. And I think that connotation, the negative connotation, it very much depends on who you are, who you live with. Um, you know, uh, kids, I hear kids, you know, my kids at school, you know, kids call each other ADHD, like, like we used to call people, you know, other things back in the day. <laughs> and, um, you know, oh, you're so ADHD. Well. Yeah, it's a label. I'm so glad to have the label now. I mean, I the label has been absolute relief. And um, what's I think what's worse than having a label is knowing there's something going on, but not knowing what it is. Yeah, definitely. You, you're gagging for a label after yeah. 20, 30 years of that. Uh, you know, a statistic that I, I think is really quite revealing is that um, on average, an ADHD -er who gets to the age of 30 by the time they're 30, they will have received 10,000 more negative comments towards them than a non adhd -er. wow. And so that goes right back into childhood to parents. Oh, come on. You know, you're always eight. Why do, you know, teachers, will you please look at the board, Thomas? You know, um, if only he tried harder. He's got great ability, but not using it. You know, if he could put himself together. All those comments, you know, friends saying, you're always late. We can't rely on you. You know, all those little comments. Why, 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 why can't you pack your own bags and actually yeah. keep them tidy? Why, what, what is the matter with you? Why don't you pick your clothes up? Why don't you just drop <laughs> everything on the floor? And yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's you know, the, for the child that, who grows into a teen, who grows into an adult, it's a constant bombardment of um, negative comments around things that we just. Well, that's the way we are. You know, my son, you know, is getting better, but he's also got ADHD. And that was part of my motivation when I was diagnosed. A month later, he was diagnosed. Yeah. And I just knew I had to knew, know everything about ADHD that I could. So I read everything, watched everything, read the scientific neurological papers. And I had to know because I wanted to do everything I could to avoid him having this, you know, this long wait to find out, you know, why things are like this. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, you know, those, all those 10,000 extra negative comments are like somebody chipping away with a hammer and chisel at your self-esteem. Yeah. And basically ADHD is self-esteem shrivels up inside them over the years. And by the time somebody gets to the end of university and they've maybe, you know, not made it through university because they couldn't turn up to lectures on time, hand in work, because, you know, at, at university, it's a month later that you've got to hand the work in. Well, a month goes past, they've forgotten about it. They get a, an alert three days before and it's a mad rush. And people, <laughs> you know, so many ADHDers leave university in the second or third year. And, um, you know, so this shriveled up self-esteem inside has basically started believing all these negative comments. And what I'm doing in my coaching is helping give them the sort of scaffolding to have the executive functions to be organized, but also to regrow that, that self-worth that has been shriveled up. You know, we have a, a rubbery kind of ego around us that protects us from all these things. 
and we say, yeah, I'm okay, I'm okay. But actually inside, it's very painful. And I hear that every day from people. Yeah. And that's why going through learning these new skills often triggers emotions. You know, the, the sort of fourth part of ADHD after the impulsivity, hyperactivity, inattention is the emotional dysregulation. We, we are affected by our emotions more than average people are. Okay, so why is that, Max? Well, the whole thing about ADHD, I mean, it's really not a very good name for the, 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 you know, the diagnosis. It doesn't really describe it well. You know, if, if it were being called something else, I would suggest dopamine deficiency because we are deficient in dopamine. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter that carries the signal in the brain of reward. So you have sex, you eat a piece of chocolate cake, you feel a rewarding sensation. Yeah. That rewarding sensation is there for a reason. If we didn't feel rewarded when we ate, we wouldn't want to come back for more. If we didn't feel rewarded having sex, we wouldn't want to come back for having more. And the human species would die out. No food, no sex, no babies, no survival. You know, So um, it's there for a good reason, but we lack it. And so dopamine helps people to lock on to stuff, to feel that rewarding sensation. You're writing an essay, you've written the title, you get a little bit of reward. Oh, I've written the title. I can carry on. First paragraph. Oh, good. I've done the first paragraph. Reward feeling. I'll write the next paragraph. What happens with us is we don't get that reward feeling because we haven't got the dopamine. And mm. so we just get distracted. We're not being rewarded by having written the title of the first paragraph. So we just, oh, a squirrel on the tree or, you know, oh, that, what's that noise over there? I'll come back in just a second. Three hours later, you haven't come back because you've forgotten. We, our memory, our, our, our working memory, short term memory is absolutely shot. Yeah. You know? So actually, I can't remember what the question was now. So I'm having an ADHD <laughs> moment. <laughs> yeah, yes. But but it's it's just such a fascinating discussion. So yeah. let's talk a little bit more about about addiction and about your own kind of addiction journey and mm. how that how you kind of fell into that and what made you what what made you really what was the catalyst for you actually um you know going into recovery and and yeah. uh yeah all of that yeah i mean f for me it um it was all i like to think that it was all you know manageable and it kind of was for a while and then it became you know the things that were happening to me including ending up in a coma uh, car accidents um you know i drove my own car off a cliff once and that was jumping out two meters before the cliff because I was too completely high and paranoid and thought I'd, um, you know, distract the police you know, and think, you know, oh, he's dead down on the rocks dead. And so, but, you know, my shoelace could have got caught on that pedal. And I, instead of getting out two meters before, um, I could have gone down with it. And so these things kept happening. Yeah. And, you know, it was all very colorful and very and terrifying for those who care for me. And, you know, I was very uh, lucky that, you know, my wife, who was, you know, we've been together for 25 years now, you know, I, that I had somebody very strong who, who, who stayed. And, um, uh, yeah, you know, um, but for my parents, you know, I, I put people near to me, my parents, my sister, my, my girlfriend at the time, um, just through horrific stuff worry and um you know it builds up and it gets to a point where you just feel you just know it can't go on like this people yeah are gonna, people are going to have to leave you because they can't handle it anymore yeah and so you know i aa was um i struggled with AA at the beginning and i struggled because i have this impulsive nature i'd be walking to an aa meeting down the king's road or whatever yeah and walk, walk past a bar and then and i was going to that aa meeting you know and the next thing i know is I'm having a pint, you know, and it's all very nice, but uh, I, I didn't intend that. And this is what happens, you know, this is why, I mean, another statistic that I, is really quite scary is that the, um, the life expectancy of untreated adult ADHD is, is reduced by between 12 and 20 years. So if you smoke a, a packet of cigarettes every day for your whole life, it reduces by, I think, nine years. So ADHD is 12 to 20 years. It's, it's, absolutely shocking and that's to do with the mixture of obesity from overeating um alcohol and drug problems driving accidents because inattentiveness you know um you don't see stuff coming you're not paying attention lots of car accidents 
and um, and also the impulsivity driving a car. You know, I'll overtake the truck now, bang, and you're off. And you needed to really calculate a bit longer. Yeah, yeah. It's and a I've also... roller coaster ride that that costs people their lives all the time. And yeah. so when people say, you know, this this thing about the um, the label, um, oh, it's a label. You know, we shouldn't be calling people like that. Having getting that label is a lifesaver because you can identify what you're dealing with. I didn't know what I was dealing with. I I know I'm a smart, um, you know, capable person. I've done all sorts of things and I can make all sorts of things happen. And I have. But at the same time, I was an absolute liability. You know, um, it is it's treacherous. And so this whole thing about, you know, um, getting diagnosed and being called ADHD or ADD or whichever it is. Um, I hope more and more people are diagnosed. For the moment, we say that eight percent, uh, five percent of the population, roughly, is ADHD. In a prison population in the, in this country, thirty five percent of the po prison population is ADHD, and that's because of the impulsivity, the just like go for it kind of attitude, which for me enabled me to build great businesses because I was just like plow through, go, 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 go. But if you imagine that same go, go, go on a kid who's in a rough growing up in a rough neighborhood and the only option he's got is to you know a friend says let's go and rob this corner shop go 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 let's go you know no thoughts just like me a mind took me to a positive place basically yeah. um but for so many people it's not positive at all whether it's addictions or crime uh you know just very destructive yeah, and of course the other thing uh, that is, I, actually my sister's ADHD, she also got a, a late yeah. diagnosis and she yeah. has it quite badly in fact, um, but yeah. one of the things that that she is is very apparent about her is the um, inattention if somebody yeah. else is speaking. So the communication oh. can also really be affected by that, can't it? Yeah. Um, and of course, yeah. people can then get very impatient and very intolerant. And yeah. it's like, you never listen to me. You're always talking yeah. about yourself. Um, is that very common as well? Yes. I mean, the, the effect on relationships is massive. Because for that reason, you know, people get fed up of having at least the impression that they're not being heard and listened to. Most a lot of the time we are listening, we're hearing it. Yeah. But we've also got another thing, another wheel turning and another wheel turning. And so it might take a poke to get us to come back. Yeah, no, no. And very often, you know, we actually have heard, but we kind of need to spin it back, play it back. Um, it, that is destructive in relationships because everybody needs to feel heard. And yes. um, the interrupting is also another thing, you know, interrupting, I yeah. I'm a terrible interrupter. And I think that's we get very understood for that. We people think, oh, they're just so rude. You know, they just want to talk about what they want to talk about. In reality, I've worked out that the reason I interrupt is because my short term memory is so bad that when I have a, I'm in a conversation with you and I have a thought that I want to say to you. And I know that if I don't say it right now in eight, 10, 12 seconds, I won't be able to remember that thought. It will have just gone, evaporated. Yeah. And I'll be sitting here going, I knew I wanted to say something to Jay. You know, so there's this, <laughs> there's this desire to oh. throw stuff out there as it comes into our heads, because we know it's not going to hang, hang, you know, hang out in our heads for very long. You know, but we get yeah. very misunderstood, I think. A lot of people, um, you know, and we can learn to tame these things. It's not easy because it's like, you know, if you're 40, it's certainly not easy. If you're... Um, you know, maybe if you're eight, you, you're still in that. But, you know, old habits die hard. And um, yeah, it, it is a battle. And that's why, you know, coaching people, I really, you have to have them for long enough to really be able to help because it takes time to embed a new habit in a non ADHD person. Yeah. But to embed it in, you know, to bet for it to bed in in an ADHD brain can take can be more challenging you know and there is also this defiancy that comes with adhd so there's a thing called oppositional defiant disorder uh -huh. so we all know people who are basically whatever you say to them they say the opposite you know whether it's right or wrong so that kind of can come with adhd for a lot of people there's a bit of defiancy so if if somebody says you know will you sit down please no i won't you know? <laughs> and, and if it had been the other way around it would have been the same opposite answer you know so and that maybe is also part of the superpower, you know, people telling you, no, you will never manage to do that. Yes, I will. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. The determination 
Yeah. Is, yeah. You know, and I've also heard that hyper focus is associated yeah. with ADHD. And as I yeah. said, I've got it in my family. I think I probably got I don't think I've got it severely, but I do think that I probably, you know, would fit a, a sort of minor diagnosis uh, because, of course, yeah. all these things sit on the spectrum. Because one mm. thing that I definitely have is this thing about hyper focus. So yeah. if I get into something and I really am into it, I don't have this uh, this issue maybe that other people have of like, this is boring, I want to stop or whatever. Yeah. I will go into it and I will get into it so much that I will not even notice time passing. And I will just yeah. go on and on and on and yeah. on, like way beyond the limits of what yeah. anybody else could. And I do recognize that that has served me very well, well in yeah. some respects. But can I ask you something? How often has that hyperfocus been available to you when you're doing something that you find boring? Uh, it's terrible. Well, never. And that oh. is that is, of course, the other thing, because um, and I don't know whether this is me or whether it is just anybody, but um, I have no tolerance, no tolerance for things that I don't I don't like. I literally yeah. cannot engage with them. Yeah. So I think uh, and I mean, maybe this is, uh, as I said, maybe, maybe this is just, you know, maybe you're one of us. Or lots of people. I don't really know. Well, but um but I think what you've described here tonight is a very, very, very clear profile. And I think people that are watching this and listening to this, I'm sure that some of them will be thinking, wait a minute, this sounds like me. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, what, what I just said about the hyper focus and actually having, you know, completely unable to engage with the things that I find boring, yeah. um, you know, other people will also, I think, perhaps resonate with that as well. So they're a whole cluster of things, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, going back to the hyper focus thing, the reason we, you know, the reason we hyper focus is because when we are really interested in something or passionate about something, you know, I might be into making model planes. And for that, I concentrate for 10 hours nonstop through the night, you know, to get this thing done. Um, but for ADHDers, we are not able to do that with something that we are not interested or interested or passionate about. No. You know, the, expert, the thing about this is that normal people have enough dopamine to enable them to have a really boring task in front of them and go, that's a really boring task. I don't want to do it. An ADHD goes, oh, that's a really boring task. I'm just going to do that instead. But a normal person, <laughs> will, a normal person will look and go, the same boring task, and it's boring to them. They say, oh, I don't really don't want to do that boring task. But then they glance out over the horizon. And what they're looking for on the horizon is the consequence of not doing that bit of work. And so once they see the consequence, they can weigh it up. The weight of the boring task for two hours or the weight of the consequence. And then they'll go, no, I don't want the consequence. I'm doing the task. That's where they get their motivation from, from looking out to see the consequences. ADHDers don't look for consequences. They're not, we're not registering them. It's all about now. We live in the present. And if that <laughs> doesn't look fun, then I'll do this instead. You know? <laughs> that but is so, so well expressed, Max. It's absolutely fantastic. So we, we have a question here, which is, does Max use a daily or weekly planner? So this is, yeah, I absolutely use a planner. I um, I didn't own a planner or a diary or a calendar until I was 30. I was living in Morocco where everybody is late and it's kind of normal. But when I moved to England and I turn up at the dentist half an hour late and I, you know, I thought like in Morocco, they might say, oh, yeah, you can slip in afterwards. No, you've missed your appointment. The next one is in a month. And I very quickly started realizing that living here, I'm going to have to start towing the line because otherwise I won't get anything done, you know. Um, so I bought a moleskin week on two page planner with a pen, you know, pen and pencil. And I used that for four years and it improved massively. But the problem with it is that it has no voice. When the moleskin planner gets another book sat of it, I can't see it anymore. And I'm not going to look at it because a planner is only as good as it's only useful if you are looking at it. So the digital version in our phones today um, has an added advantage, which makes the to you know a complete difference in that it can shout at me and it can say beep 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 beep. I need you to look at me now because there is something I need to show you that you need to see now. And it, I then get the alert. Oh yeah, in two hours I've got to be. 
And without the voice in the planner, it's no good. So I teach people to use um, digital calendars and I have a, a system that I've kind of come up with myself over the last 15 years since the four years of Moleskin ended. I went to digital and I really battled with it because there, there is so much functionality and so many, you know, our thing can do all this stuff. And of course, for me, all that functionality was just a distraction. I would get lost in, and distracted from actually what I'm supposed to be doing in that calendar. So I removed all the, all, the, all the extras and boiled it down to something very, very simple that I could manage. And I now realize that what I built is great for other ADHDers as well. And so the first thing I generally teach people in the first couple of sessions is my organizational system, um, which has only two rules, which is pretty unique in that, you know, normally these, there are lots of rules, but mine only has two rules and um, they learn it easily and it does change everything because when you're no longer late when you can turn up on time with the things you are expected to turn up with you know not the right day but the wrong week you know you turn up and you're not getting these this feeling of failure oh you know i did it again i felt you know because we we don't plan to be late um and those little failures all the time they are chipping away at that self-esteem and what happens yeah. is self-esteem grows back through being organized and the stresses of all these kind of arrows being fired at you, you're late for this, your mother's calling, you're the, and it's all like that. These stresses lead to, when there are multiple stresses at the same time, we go, I'm overwhelmed, I can't function. And overwhelm can last five minutes or it can last a year, anywhere between. You know, there are overwhelms that people get stuck in for more than a year and it becomes a depression. And, you know, and the other thing I should say is that so many of us are misdiagnosed. You know, I was. I had anxiety and OCD from 11. I was on all sorts of medications for those and therapy for anxiety and panic attacks. And, you know, at the end of the day, when I went on ADHD medication, the anxiety, the OCD and the panic attacks went because they were just symptoms of the ADHD. They were comorbidities with the ADHD. So all these doctors and all these therapists and all these really wonderful, helpful people totally missed the ball for 20 years in my case and i'm glad i got diagnosed because I, my nightmare is thinking imagine i hadn't been lucky enough to find out and i had the rest of my life which probably would have ended in catastrophe um you know not ever having understood oneself not having and it's not to have excuses it's to have explanations, finally getting explanations. And this is the same if you're 15 or you're 20 or you're 50 or 80. What a gift to finally retrospectively get yeah. an explanation to all that stuff that you always wondered, am I just a nutcase? You know, am I just <laughs> useless? Am I just, you know, incapable? Am I, am I just really different? I think that's we're the all thing. All different. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're all am different. I Am I so different that I'm never going to be, other people are never going to understand me? I think that's what happens maybe when you have these, when you have a, a profile like that. Yeah. That you, think. Um, you know, I, it's very genetic. So we tend to find that it's, you know, now that, now that I know, I can, I can see it pretty much in my dad. Um, he's not bothered because he's old enough to not really, you know, wor worry him. But I look at his family and in his family, there are three cousins. And in the children of those cousins, there is a lot of ADHD, um, Asperger's, um, you know, it's all over the place. And yeah. Yeah. So we've got Richard here who um, nice. he says, he's, I have anxiety and panic disorders and high, he's a high functioning autistic. So yeah. that that is what he is. So do those do all those um, comorbidities, uh, mm. as you call them, do they all go together? Are, is it common for ADHD people to have um, autistic traits, for example, or, or is it just very different? I wouldn't say it's common to have. I mean, there are quite there are a lot of people out there who have ADHD and are also on the spectrum. You know, they they can go together. Um, but I don't think it's a, a majority. It's, a, it, you know, there are quite a lot. But you know, what does go very, very commonly or what gets discovered before the ADHD are, you know, we struggle with anxiety, depression, um, mm -hmm. OCD, and those things are all relating to 
serotonin as a neurotransmitter. So if yeah. you, when people go to the doctor and say, I feel depressed, and the doctor gives them SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, they, they, they slow the reuptake of the serotonin to make more available serotonin. And that serotonin is the happy chemical. It's what, you know, if you're depressed, anxious, or got OCD, it's all fear and anxiety. And so the happy chemical, more of it in your brain, enables us to feel less stressed, anxious. And it's the same. So dopamine is the ADHD version. It's the neurotransmitter of reward. And not having that reward feeling has all these, provo you know, pro provokes all these symptoms of not being able to lock on to things, focus, uh, bad memory, impulsivity. Um, so, yeah, very often people will find that they've got anxiety or depression, um, and they will be treated for years and years and given SSRIs when actually what they really need is the ADHD version, which isn't raising the level of serotonin, but it's raising the level of dopamine. And yeah. I mean, I actually still take both. I, I've been on SSRIs for my panic disorder for many years, but I take the SSRIs and I take the, the, the same similar thing in the dopamine version because I don't want panic attacks and I'm not actually prepared to even go there to find out whether I still have panic attacks. You know, it's like panic attacks had me leaving my car halfway through a tunnel or on a bridge because I was terrified and I just had to get off and the traffic wasn't moving fast enough. So I walked, you know, impulsive. Oh, um, yeah. Very scary. You know, um, it's so these things do go together. I think that because people aren't treating their ADHD, they're suffering with those um, symptoms, which are often depression, anxiety, and the depression is also fueled by the repetitive failure. You know, if you're losing your job every three weeks, yeah, you, you know, you're going to get down about it, and you're going to start really feeling life is where where's it going? And obviously, yeah. a part of that twelve to twenty years less longevity, a part of that is made up by suicide. Sadly, yeah, so sad. So sad, of yeah. course, and and that is the leading cause of of death um, amongst uh, young people, amongst um, men. Um, yeah. It really men is. Men in their forties. I mean, you know. Yeah. So you know, if you don't know you have ADHD, um, and you are having lots of problems in your relationships because you are emotionally dysregulated, and when somebody says to you, "Would you mind putting that dish over on the," and you go, "What the?" Heck? You know, that's what happens when you're emotionally dysregulated your reactions to comment or re normal requests can be um, out of place. And so that's not going to help a relationship, you know, unless there's basically unconditional love there. So um, friendships, partners, um, work relationships, colleagues, you know, there's a limit to how much they can handle and they just start going, the guy's nuts. He's not nuts. He's lacking dopamine. And with, uh, with a simple pill taken in the morning, once in the morning, he will transform almost overnight, literally. You know, the first time I took the ADHD medication, it was like, I, I've often heard it described as not being able to see very well. And then suddenly somebody gives you a pair of spectacles and you put them on. <gasps> I can see. I didn't realize how badly I couldn't see. And ADHD medication is like that. It doesn't cure ADHD, but for the eight hours or the three hours, depending which medication you take, it's like putting on glasses. You put the glasses on, your brain works as everybody else's does, and then it runs out at the end of the day, and you come back to being ADHD max, and you go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. But, you know, during the time that you're out and about, into, into, you know, interlocking with other people and um, organizations and things, you're better off having the glasses on because you kind of see like everybody else does. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's amazing, okay. amazingly powerful. So we've got a, a question here, which is, is FOMO uh, fear of missing out typical mm. for ADHDers? I, I would imagine the answer is probably yes. Yeah, I, I think the fear doesn't last very long because we then, very, if we think we're missing out, we very impulsively go wherever we think <laughs> we're missing out. You know, um, um, but yeah, fear of missing out, <laughs> I, don't actually, I don't think I've had so much fear of missing out. I, I think I had fear of missing out when I first got sober. You know, then I felt like I was missing out everything. You know, everybody's out there drinking and having fun. Actually, half of them are drinking and not having fun. You know, they're drinking because they are compelled to drink because they do, do it all the time and they can't survive their own emotions without 
a chemical to change the way they feel because they're not feeling great about themselves or about their lives or about whatever it is. And so, you know, we're a highly drugged up nation. Alcohol's legal. It's a, it's a mind changing chemical like all the others. Yeah. And it certainly kills more people than all the others. Way more people. Yes. Um, but people, you know, are in a, a, a there's a lot of fear when you start talking in this country to people about, you know, maybe, you know, not drinking or, or you say to them, oh, I'm not drinking. It's amazing if you're standing in a pub and you they realize you're not drinking they will do most people will do everything they can to get you drinking oh go on just have one you know you'll be fine and um it's mainly because they feel uncomfortable drinking because it's make it's kind of raising the question of you know is it all right are you all right um that the fear of missing out yes when i wasn't in a pub and i thought everybody else was then i felt i was missing out but yeah. all i have to do is drive around at about half past 11 you know at the time i was living in london when i got sober and i'd drive around and see girls vomiting all over each other and you know on the floor with broken heels and and guys fighting and you know they probably don't even know what they're fighting about but it's what happens when the pub closes yeah and that kind of balanced out my fear of missing out and you know i had my version of um, the leaving the pub in a bad state, you know, I, it would take me to some very dark places, you know, with, you know, you've done the drinking, now you want the next thing, it's going to be a drug or another drug, and you end up on ve in very dodgy places with dangerous people. And um, yeah, age helps as well. I think the fear of missing out has become less with age. Um, sorry, I am. Okay. And the one symptom I haven't talked about is that talking a lot. <laughs> so you have to like time me out <laughs> okay well um so max um how can people get hold of you what, what what's the best place to find you sure so well my website which is um max lawrence with a w l a w r e n c e dot c o so www max lawrence dot c o not dot com just c o OK. OK. So go there if you want to get in touch with Max. Now, if somebody has been listening to this and thinks, wait a minute, this is me. I like all of a sudden the light bulb has gone on. Mm. Uh, how would they go about getting a diagnosis for themselves? Is it as simple yeah. as booking an appointment with a doctor? It's not simple. It's simple if you can go privately. Um, but as with a lot, you know, with the NHS and certainly mental health, departments of the NHS are very overstretched. I think the average waiting time for an adult to be seen for an ADHD assessment on the NHS is two years plus. So that's, you know, that's a long time when you're struggling. And, that, and that's here in the UK because that's we have UK. listeners on the podcast all over the world. So I would imagine yeah. that in some countries it's non-existent. Yeah, I mean, it really varies around the world, um, you know, but certainly with you know, apart from Scandinavia, where you probably, you know, you call up and they send somebody around 10 minutes later you know, <laughs> um, because they've got the funds. Um, you know, in the UK, it's really hard. And we have we have thousands of people on waiting lists to get an assessment by a psychiatrist um, and, hope, you know, get a diagnosis. And once you have that diagnosis, um, I mean, you can start working on your ADHD before having a diagnosis. I, I coach people who are not diagnosed officially. Um, they're not on medication. The medication really helps to it helps us focus so that we can focus on understanding our stuff, learning new tricks and basically building scaffolding around us to survive ADHD better. But yeah, so I coach people who, who are not diagnosed. But the advantage to getting a diagnosis is that the medication is so effective. There is no other psychiatric um, uh, psychological problem that needs medication where the medication is so effective as ADHD. ADHD medication works for 80% of people with ADHD. And then if that if the stimulant medication doesn't work, there are other routes, non-stimulant medication, which are less effective. But the ADHD medication is so effective that I say to people, they say to me, should I, should I try the medication? Should I get diagnosed to try the medication? And I have to say to them, I, I really believe everybody should try it because for me, the day I started taking that medication, my life changed um, so, so massively. And so even if you try it and you decide you don't like it, I, I, I you know, I encourage people to try it because the, the results can be totally life enhancing.
So can you just walk into a chemist um, and no. and say, can I have this ADHD medication? I think I've got it. Oh, no, 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 absolutely okay, not. So... Uh, stimulant medication is, um, a, is a controlled substance. You know, um, you have two types. There's the methylphenidate and there is the amphetamine base. But obviously amphetamine is a class B um, narcotic. So um, this is this is medical. You know, this is uh, I mean, made for ADHD people, but you absolutely cannot buy it over the counter. You need a prescription from a psychiatrist and, you know, it's expensive. So if you're doing it privately, initially, it's a lot of money, but then your psychiatrist can pass you back to your GP. And then you can, once you've been stabilized and titrated onto the right dose, your GP can then pr um, provide you with a, um, an NHS prescription. So you just pay the NHS prescription amount because it's hundreds of pounds a month um, otherwise. So for yeah. many people, it's it, it, it's out of range. And this is something that I really hope will uh, change because, um, you know, if you can't wait two and a half years for a, an assessment, yeah, you, your only years. route is to go and spend um, an outrageous amount of money for a three hour assessment. You know, we're talking around a thousand pounds. And for, for, for a lot of people, that's just not possible. And so they have to wait. And ultimately, that wait kills people. Yeah, you know, it kills people because it can be really hard. And, um, you know, some people can't hold on. Yeah. Oh, so it's it's absolutely tragic, really, isn't it? They, mm. they ought to, you know, they ought to do something about that for sure. Yeah. Well, Max, all I can say is that it's been such a pleasure. I knew this was going to be an absolutely amazing interview. And I'm sure that uh, people who have listened to it, it's they're going to be thinking quite long and hard about some of the things that we've been talking about today. So I just wanted to thank you so much for com coming on. And this is can I say one more thing, Jane? Before the end. I, there's one thing I, I, I'd like to put out there, and that is that when we were tribes living in Africa, yeah. Um, when we were hunter gatherers and th there's research done where they've sent scientists to work out how what the percentage of adhd people are in each tribe and they've looked at tribes and basically we've understood that before farming when we were all hunter gatherers the most successful tribes were the ones that had the highest percentage of adhd as why because we're great in the impulsive moment the tiger runs past off we go bang 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 we we will go and catch that tiger we're great in that uh, you know crazy moment but when farming came along um, and farming, you have to plant, sow your seeds at the right time. You have to remember to water every day and you have to you know, get them out of the ground before they shrivel up. It's all about timing. It all became about time. And we live in a farmer's world now. So um, this thing about the stigma, actually going back, you know, in different contexts, we were top dog, <laughs> the ADHD tribe. We were the best. We grew biggest, strongest because we had more food. You know, we had great ideas of making tools. We were absolutely ahead of the game. But since it became a farmer's game and our modern world is a farmer's game, you've got to be at work on time. You've got to be at school on time. I just wanted to put that out there to for anybody, for the ADHD people. We are not useless. We are actually really quite um, worth having around. And this leads to mixing teams in the workplace. I think there's a lot more to do about getting neurodiverse people into roles to work much, you know, to work with um, all the other people, because there is stuff that we can do really well. And so, I, you know, this is another area that I'm really interested in is promoting um, active recruitment of neurodiverse people to do, you know, um, uh, GCHQ use uh, dyslexic people for recognizing people in crowds because they've got an, an ability many of them to pick out faces from a crowd very quickly and um yeah so we can be yeah, I mean, look, that's a really interesting topic because when I ran my <laughs> design agency, it was a very yeah. high level uh, design agency and it was also a production company because we specialized in TV design. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that all of the designers, not with without fail, all of them, every single one was dyslexic. These were yeah. highly talented people working in one of the most competitive fields in the world. Yeah. And really uh, for our business, for what it did, it was mm. absolutely one of the best in the world. Yeah. Um, and ironically, they were all of them. They were dyslexic. Yeah. And they also uh, played bass guitar. <laughs> a lot of them play bass guitar. I don't know why. It's got to go together. But look at code. You know, people programming computer programs. There's a very high percentage of ADHD and um, autism. 
in computer coding because they have the right minds for it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there is there are all sorts of things. And I hope this gets becomes more mainstream, you know. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. So ADHD, uh, a business superpower. It can be a superpower, but you have to learn how to manage it and control it. So uh, Max is the guy to help you with that. So thank you so much, Max, for coming on the show today. It's been such a pleasure. And what a great conversation we've had. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for keeping me moving forwards with my procrastination. I recommend you. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you, Max. Thank you.